Welcome to the Pinelander Podcast, the official podcast of Pineland, broadcasting to you from an undisclosed location deep inside Pineland, where we discuss faith, family, finances, firearms, freedom, food, and everything else in between with those who believe in living free and living out the values that made this country free. Right, welcome to the Pine Lander Podcast. My name is Paul Lefebvre. I'm here with my Ranger buddy, Mike Blackburn. Today is Friday, the 2nd of June, 2023. And today we're uh, actually going to talk about something that uh, we've been advertising for a while. We've been talking about faith, family, firearms, and food. So we finally got around to the food. About, about time. <laughs> it's about time. It took, uh, let's see, 74 episodes so for our faithful uh, Pine Lander Podcast listeners, we finally got there. That's right. You've been patient, but here it is. <laughs> uh, and today we want to bring on uh, Jeremy Bucket, uh, who's living out in the great state of Wyoming. Uh, he's got uh, his his shtick, his Rustic Hills homestead. Uh, and I don't know what else to say, but shtick. So sorry, Jeremy. But hey, Jeremy, welcome to the podcast. Mike, Paul, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we uh, we recognized that we needed to have an expert come on, and because yeah. uh, neither Paul nor I um, know much about this, I yeah. I have a garden. Um, I do have some chickens. I have a couple of ducks, um, and I know nothing. And and yeah. well, and, and and not long ago, I knew yeah. nothing. But um, you know, just trying to dabble in it, trying to realize that uh, I just wanted to be. I wanted to be kind of in control of my own sort of food destiny as, yeah. as much as possible. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we've all just recently, uh, you know, went through the whole, you know, COVID pandemic, if you will. Um, and, you know, played around trying to find toilet paper and all the other nonsense. And it was really sort of an awakening for a lot of us that, uh, wow, man, I mean, things can, you know, not be available mm-hmm. on the shelves. And, I don't really like the idea of that. Uh, so I'm glad I'm glad you have the time for us. I'm glad you're you know you're you're giving us an hour of your time to to sort of educate us and and how how does somebody you know you know do this and uh, you know maybe you start out first with your story and how you got involved. Sure. Um, so first of all, expert. Uh, if anyone tells you they're an expert at homesteading, they're a liar. Uh, it's it's a constant evolution of everyday learning but uh you know i might know a little bit more along the way i can say there's no landmines this far so the way we started out 2007 2008 we were living outside of birmingham alabama and i was in undergrad and i said you know we should get some chickens because i like eggs i had an acre of land out there and we got these chickens and let me tell you chickens are the gateway drug to farming (laughs) <laughs> so, uh, Love that. that's true nice so if you got some chickens and some ducks you're, you're getting yourself hooked um but we started with just a small flock of chickens and i'd say pretty much most homesteaders you know if, if you've got a green thumb plants are awesome we do a little growing we're putting in a high tunnel this year but for the most part uh chickens are probably the easiest livestock to get into um and they are rewarding because you do get that daily uh, breakfast, as well as if you do meat birds, you can always, you know, get at least a meat source there. And like I said, they're fairly easy to to handle. Uh, they're pretty hardy. Just watch what breed you're going to get for your climate. But anyway, we um, we had those chickens. We moved from Alabama up to Boston for my graduate work, and just outside of Boston, I picked up another chicken coop. And started another flock and we kept going that way and then i finished up and we moved out to southern california and i got chickens and i made a much bigger run for them it was a larger flock and i told my wife i said you know what I'd, I'd really like to get a dairy goat because i thought well some milk would be nice to go with my eggs in the morning and we went and we got this goat and she was supposed to be pregnant and she was supposed to be having her kid within about a week to 10 days, according to the lady we bought her from. So 
we've got this goat and week 10 days goes by, there's no kid. And I'm starting to get nervous because I'm doing my homework and it says that goats are herd animals and they don't like to be alone. So I went to this livestock auction and I went to go get a companion goat for the first goat. And they had, I did get that. And they also had these little piglets that they're selling at this livestock auction. So uh, I got one for like 20 bucks yeah, and I'm scratching this pig's head. They're just so cute. They, they, they are. <laughs> and for 20 bucks, I'm thinking you can't go wrong. You know, it's a little, yeah. it, they, they sold it as a, a heritage breed. It's an American guinea hog. And that was the original homesteaders pig. In the old pictures, you see that black hairy pig out in the front yard. Yeah. That's what they were. So I'm scratching this pig's head as it's sitting in the, you know, where you put your feet in the passenger side of the uh, Chrysler with a goat in the back and the pig in the front. And I get home and I'm just thinking my wife and kids are going to kill me for bringing this pig home. And I let it out and they loved it. They went gaga over it. So uh, shortly after that, we decided to name our farm the Zufalig Farm. And let me tell you, Zufalig in German means accidental or random. And that is very much how my farm started. <laughs> so I say all that to lead into, for beginner homesteaders, you might not want to go that route. Um, if I could do things over again and be a little bit smarter about it, I would have done more homework up front and I would have done more planning up front. Uh, that being said, I've enjoyed what we've been doing. You know, we started with those chickens, a couple of goats and that one pig. We went and we got a, a boar to sire more pigs. And I've been raising pigs from that, those original uh, pigs for several years now. I love the meat off of those American guinea hogs. They're a great lard pig. Uh, I continue to do chickens, ducks. We have a herd of goats. They're La Mancha goats. So if you ever see the goats that have the little tiny elf ears, that's what they are, the, the original American breed of goat. And since then, so we're living in Southern California at an acre and three quarters. On that acre and three quarters, we had all those things. Plus, I ended up getting myself a Dexter cow with a calf. A Dexter cows are the smallest breed of meat cow. It's an Irish breed. That mama cow that we just processed a couple of weeks ago, and the, the meat looks phenomenal. It tastes great, too. She only stood up to about my hip. So fairly small, easy to, to work with. Um, they don't eat as much, but they do produce more per, per amount of feed that you give them. So we got those cows. Now I have three and we have another one in the freezer. My daughters have been training uh, wild Mustangs and they run barrels and poles in the rodeo. And what else do we have? Gee. This we all started with chickens. Well, well, let me well, let me ask you <laughs> now because now because you were okay. So I'm I'm just assuming um, that your initial uh, place where you you know you got your chickens right, yeah, um, Alabama, then up into Boston, and then down to L.A. But you're not talking about you're not talking about a farm. I mean, you're talking about really just a large lot. Um, I mean, these are things that you can do in an urban environment. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you weren't out in the country in Boston. So no, in Boston, we, uh, we were just outside of Boston, a little town called Waltham. I was lucky enough that where we were living, we did have a little bit of acreage and we backed up to uh, diocese land. So it was kind of wooded, but for the most part, it was a neighborhood. So you can, you know, so you've been pretty successful. I mean, really starting out in a neighborhood setting because we have, you know, a large part, you know, obviously a large portion of the population now lives in, in sort of an urban environment. So yeah. this isn't really something that, you know, you're, you're, you're needing 10 or 20 acres to do. Nope. Even when I upsized to having three horses, a burrow, two cows, goats, pigs, and chickens, I only did all that on an acre and a half, That's about it. an hour outside of LA. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. Now you do, and, and this is for the listeners, you do have to check your, your local zoning regulations and make sure that you know you're not going to get yourself in trouble. For the most part with chickens, I'm not telling anybody to break the law, but if you don't have a rooster, it's yeah, pretty yeah. low likelihood that anyone's ever even going to know that they're there. Right, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> yeah. And that's the way and that's the way we're doing it right now because uh, in the 
the city limits, um, you know, they, they allow you to have chickens, but they just don't want the rooster. I guess the neighbors don't right. want to have to deal with that. And a lot of people yeah. don't realize, I'm, I'm sure our, your listeners are much smarter than most, but I've gotten the question so many times. So if you don't have a rooster, how do you get eggs? Right. And yeah. it's, you don't need a rooster to get eggs, just like any female biology, the eggs are produced on a regular cycle. <laughs> That's right. So, now, see, so, I, I think there's another thing too. That here's a, another question. Now, th- this is you know you're not doing this full time. I mean, you have a day job. So, I have a, so how well, much how much time is your family kind of devoting to you know homestead tasks, and how are you sort of balancing uh, you know your your career as well? That's a great question. So. We now live in Northeast Wyoming, just outside Gillette. I have 40 acres and a lot more to do with 40 acres. Now, originally when I started out, I had two young daughters that were gaga over doing all the, you know, one of them won the Southern California goat milking championship and they loved 4-H and they wanted to do everything with the animals all the time. Well, now they're teenagers. So I don't get quite as much help from the daughters anymore. They've got a lot of other things going on. My father retired and he came up and lives with us and he's my ranch hand. So the day-to-day chores on the farm, just feeding and watering the animals, my father does, it takes about an hour every morning. I work a full-time job, four days a week, 10 hour shifts. So after I get home, if there's daylight, I'm usually doing some kind of project or just double checking on the animals. And then on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, is when I'm doing not only the animal chores, but all the big projects for the week of either improving the farm or fixing something that got broken, which happens all the time. Yeah. So anyway, you've, you, you're on this journey. You, you know, you started out small. You started out in, in a very urban setting, uh, less than two acres. You're up to 40 now. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the lessons that you've learned, some of the takeaways, some of the things that you would have done different? Absolutely. So, like I said, we went into this kind of very haphazardly and just, I I guess our theme was get the animal, then figure it out. Um, There's always learning to be done. But for anyone out there, I would say the first thing you want to think about is what direction do you want your homestead to go? Is this for self-sufficiency? Do you want to be able to sell at farmer's market? Do you want to do both? What types of animals do you see yourself getting into? And then plan around that. And planning involves several different things. So firstly, check into the animals or the crops that you want to grow and then see for your area, how well do those things do in the climate that you're in? What special needs might they have because of the climate, the soil, that sort of thing? If you're interested in animals, make sure that you have a good relationship with a a local vet that knows how to work with those animals. And make sure that you have enough infrastructure and space to handle however much you want to scale up to. And when I say that, there's a simple rule here. Whatever you think, go bigger because you're going to grow into it. And that goes with equipment, too. You know, whatever tractor size you think you need, you probably need a bigger one. Because as you go, things will build and you will need more um, more lifting power, more ability to use implements, all those sorts of things. And that's not just for me. I've talked to so many other people who have run into that exact same thing. They either ran out of space or they ran out of uh, equipment power and had to go and buy something else. So before you buy three things, think about what one thing you could buy that'll do the job of all three. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. And and, uh, it's, it's actually excellent advice. Um, another question, at least I have in, for your situation, um, is, is where, where are you at as far as your self-reliance? Are you, um, is that something you're concerned with? Is that something that, um, that you can network and let's say there's a, a neighbors that are homesteading, uh, maybe doing some different things than you're doing, uh, where you guys can, uh, share resources, uh, exchange food? Uh, I mean, how, how are you doing it in, in your situation? Sure. So I'd say the barter system is alive and well here in Northeast Wyoming. I frequently will, um, 
let's say I need to borrow a mini excavator to, to dig the area where I'm going to put in our high tunnel. I have a buddy who's got a mini X and I borrow that from him. Obviously I put gas in it, but I also give him, you know, some pork and some eggs and that sort of thing. Um, so it does rather than going to the rental place where I'm going to pay hundreds of dollars on the day to rent that mini X, I could have it for a week or so and, you know, help this guy out with some food that he doesn't have. And I get the equipment for a bit. And, and there are several other things like that. Now you ask me how self-sufficient are we? I'd say we're a good way there. We're not completely off the grid. Um, I would like to set up a few more things as far as electricity. Uh, we are on well water, so that's good. But as far as food goes, I am not insecure. I have all the food and all the variety of food that I could really need. Um, it's more the the animals. So most of them are on pasture, but up here in the winter, we do have to supplement with either hay, and I don't have the right type of infrastructure to be able to hay my own land, unfortunately, or grain for certain things like the chickens and the pigs. And those things are things that I have to go out and buy. So that's why I say, if you're thinking about selling at a farmer's market, it's important to look at, you know, what are the demands at the farmer's market? What sort of niche can you get in and make a good living selling your extra that your family doesn't use at the farmer's market to throw that money back into the farm for feed for the animals and that sort of thing? Yeah, I was just thinking about what you're talking, uh, Jeremy, is, uh, you know, somebody living in, in uh, East Coast, like Carolinas, mm -hmm. you know, how can they, uh, obviously they would start the impetus to, to uh, have your own homestead, obviously, is to be off the grid. I mean, to be at least uh, um, in some way, so that if things go haywire, you know, right. then we can we can fall back. We got a fallback plan. Like right now, mine is really nothing. I got, I think I you're about from, ten pounds of rice in the. Your fallback plan is Walmart. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but uh, and, and that's pretty much where I'm at. But I, I instantly see the value of, of uh, thinking like this and living like this. And uh, <clears throat> so for, say, some, uh, you know, some dummy like me, uh, I would start off with uh, – now, after, our, after my chickens and stuff like that, what, what you're – the line of uh, thinking I'm seeing here is uh, not only sustaining yourself but also turn your homestead into something that can monetize – you know, can monetize yourself. Is that, right. am I hearing what you're saying? So, you gotta, yes you gotta and no. see, kind of, okay. I, I, I don't want people to get the idea that you're going to get rich homesteading, yeah. you know, or that you can <laughs> keep, like yeah, for keep me. your day job. Right. And, <laughs> and for honestly, if I could, I would retire tomorrow and do nothing but homestead. I love the lifestyle, but unfortunately, I went and got a lot of really expensive degrees. The smarter <laughs> people are going to be the ones that go into this debt free uh. and if they want to make it a full-time thing, it, I've seen that work. Um, but again, you have to have a really good outlet for your, the extra product that you have as far as the farmer's market. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. You're going to need, so you, need yeah, to so know. You, like what you're saying, you need to kind of know what's out there yeah. and you got to be able to right. fill that void. Now what I'm, right. what, what, what like I'm like where we are, where we are, we have a really small farmer's market. I can barely make enough on the farmer's market to put back into feed for the animals. So I, I couldn't even say that my farm necessarily pays for itself all the time. It relies on my day job quite a bit. Right. I have a buddy in outside of Cornell, New York. They've got a phenomenal farmer's market over there. He's full-time farms and he's debt-free. He's doing great. So you, like I said, if you're looking at land and you're looking to purchase land to start a homestead, or you're looking at moving to a different region of the country, it's worthwhile looking into what potential outlet do you have for, any extra product that you have thinking ahead always helps when you're doing these sort of ventures, right? I did not do that. <laughs> well, yeah. And I, and I think that's, that's another important aspect though. And cause the way um, this, well, I was thinking when you were telling your story and, and I think a lot of people do this, you know, you, you, your progression in homesteading was really sort of out of your own passion and your own uh, likes and desires. I mean, you know, the, the pig was cute, you know, the, you wanted milk from the goat. Um, yep. I think it, I think there's probably an aspect of this where, you know, you have to have some interest. You have to have some love and uh, some dedication into this. Uh, 
you know, it can't just be completely monetary. Um, you know, there's there's got to be something spiritual about it if you really want to get into it. There's something that just kind of fulfills you. I, I totally agree. And I think that was really where this grew for me from that initial spark was I had a, an innate desire to make sure that my family was taken care of with the best possible um, food that I could provide for them, which I knew would be food that I provided from my own land and my own efforts. Um, and then as I went along and I kind of was talking to Mike about this yesterday, you know, homesteading for me is the perfect life. It is all encompassing. I have different challenges every day that keep my mind sharp. I have plenty of physical work that keeps my body sharp. I get the gratification of knowing that the food on my table is coming from my land and my efforts. And I get to help some of my neighbors on occasion with uh, products from my farm. And that's a lot of pride. So, you know, the one thing I would say is you can't have a fear of failure because no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, no matter how on top of everything you try to stay, there's always going to be a day where something bad happens, right? Especially when you're dealing with livestock. I have one of my favorite goats. She got twisted up in a hay net and she mangled her front leg. And there's been, it's a couple months and every day it eats at me a little bit when I see her come over to me. She's doing okay, but she's kind of three-legged now. So that's just one example. You lose an animal here and there, no matter what you do. And you can't let that get you down. You just have to look at the overall picture, you know, trying to do the right thing every day and trying to solve the problems before they really get to be big or before they even come up. And that's that's an excellent exercise in both humility and exercising the my will and my smarts, so to speak, right? Yeah, because I, I you know, I'm I'm certainly at the very beginning levels of this um, this endeavor. But um, I've noticed what you're kind of talking about, which is, you know, the food tastes better out of your own garden. Oh, yeah. um, yes, um, I've had, I've lost animals, okay? And, and a lot of it has been just my own neglect, uh, you know, just to be honest. Uh, because a lot of this is, unfortunately, trial and error. Um, yeah. I didn't have the benefit of having, uh, you know, a, a mother and a father that homesteaded that, you know, passed along a lot of, you know, really good animal husbandry skills to me. I, you know, had to do this, you know, kind of just go into it and do the best you can and you're going to, and you're going to make some mistakes. Um, but you are right. Um, Lord, you just chickens. I, if I could, the, the difference of where I'm at with just my knowledge of chickens over the past year or so is just, just phenomenal. You know, you can't get good at anything until you do it, but um, there is sort of a satisfaction. It's almost like um, we were designed to live and work in a garden. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's almost beckoning back to Adam and Eve. It, it almost feels like um, I've, I've done plenty of things like a lot of people have. I mean, lots of various different blue-collar jobs. But have you not found homesteading to be the most satisfying sort of natural thing you've ever been involved in? No, oh, absolutely. Like I said, it's, to me, an all-encompassing, very satisfying life. All the things I mentioned, I get to do all those things on my land here in Wyoming, out in the, you know, looking at the beautiful blue sky, seeing the grass and looking at the pond on my property, it's gorgeous. And like I said, there's always that uh, gratification of knowing that everything that comes out of that farm, my effort went into and my care. You know, a lot of people have trouble with the idea of sacrificing an animal for food. But every animal on my farm, I can say with confidence, lives a great life, and I take great care of them, and they have more, more area than they'd ever need up until that last day. And that last day goes real quick, you know? Yeah, there's, so, a, there's a huge difference between um, corporate farming, lot. Right? right? Right, corporate yeah. farming. Uh, you know, people have no problem, like, going into – uh, the grocery store and buying the chicken off the shelf. Um, 
I can but assure those chickens you, I have never seen sunlight. I can, <laughs> yeah, I can assure you that the yeah. chickens coming off of your farm um, are having one hell of a lot better life than those chickens that you're getting off the grocery store. Yeah. Yeah. My meat birds, I move them on pasture every day. They get fresh grass every day. And like I said, they have a great life right up until that last day. And I can guarantee you, they really don't see it coming. Yeah. I'm a and, member of, uh, uh, PETA also, yeah. uh, people eating, uh, tasty animals. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> the original PETA. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it is funny because I do recall, um, reading an article one time about, um, a lady who was just, you know, dead against, um, you know, eating meat whatsoever. Uh, you know, it was just cruel. Uh, wasn't meant to do it. Uh, it, but she came out, she ended up going to Europe and living with a, um, a, a small family with a, with a small farm and they raised their animals. Um, and they had a small uh, farm and she said it was absolutely enlightening, uh, to her because she had never really looked at um, where meat comes from okay, right. until then. And it was, it was that realization when she actually realized the process. Okay. It's, it just doesn't magically show up in a wrapper in the store. Um, and, and she learned a responsibility for um, raising meat, raising uh, animals that, that, that are there for our consumption. And I think she, uh, and the article is fantastic because she was just talking about that balance that she sort of, uh, was able to, uh, get to in, in her perspective and how she sort of saw things. Yeah. There's every animal on my farm. There's definitely, um, a relationship between us and the animals. You know, we love our animals. We show them affection. They have a great life. Most of the stuff that's in this, and, and unfortunately, you're absolutely right. Most people don't realize where their food comes from and what the different options are. So most of the stuff in the main chain grocery stores are coming from these industrialized farms where chickens have never seen daylight or never seen a blade of grass. Uh, cows and pigs are raised sometimes in cement pad buildings just about. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, beef and pork are two of the few are two of the only meat um, food products that it's not required for them to tell you what country of origin it came from. Wow. So we're actually getting a lot of it from overseas and their practices of raising those animals there. Nowhere near as humane as living on my farm. <laughs> Well, let's talk about the other aspect, um, if you wouldn't mind, Jeremy. I mean, that is really the impact that uh, homesteading and your lifestyle uh, has on your children and your family. Mm -hmm. um, is there's got to be a huge difference between, uh, and it really doesn't matter whether you're in L.A. or you're out in Wyoming. Um, when you're introducing uh, gardening, when you're introducing uh, animal husbandry uh, to your children, what, what, what's the benefit of that? So my kids are homeschooled and we've been homesteading almost as long as they've been homeschooled. And it's been great for classroom projects, right? So I have been able to teach them a lot about biology, math, economics, all just through homesteading. Um, not to mention teaching them the value of life and of relationships and of hard work. So all of those things have been imparted to my children primarily through the, the driver of homesteading. And as we definitely have come together very closely over what we've put into our farm. Now, you know, it's true. The girls now are teenagers and they're out doing sports and some other things. And, but they still, uh, when, we're having a big evolution on the farm, like trying to get the pigs into the trailer for processing day. You know, everybody, it's all hands on deck and they come down, they help. And I know any day that if uh, my ranch hand or I couldn't do the chores, I can get one of the girls to, to go down and do it. And I feel confident that they know what they're doing because I've shown them 
the right way to get it done and they have the work ethic to do it. So I think it's been really valuable. I look at my children and I look at some other children and I'm pretty proud of, of what we've accomplished with our girls. And I know that they're decent human beings. And a lot of that is because I've been able to teach them those lessons through homesteading and through helping the animals and doing hard work. Yeah, right. The, uh, I mean, this is a this is a holistic. Uh, I mean, it's a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can how how far you want to get into this. Uh, like right right now, for me, um, I'm not into this at all. But I want to do that, and I think uh, I think homeschooling. Uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of homeschooling, uh, but homeschooling actually looks like it dovetails into with this lifestyle. I mean, it's holistic. Holistic, um, and I think uh, I mean, obviously, you're you're teaching your your daughters, they're they're actually uh, helping you on the farm. They're oh, yeah. doing. They're, they they have their chores, you know. And uh, this is something I never, I never did growing up. I didn't grow up on a farm, but I know the guys that did, and uh, they were always like uh, useful guys to know. They knew these other things yeah. that uh, those city slickers didn't know. I mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of pros, a lot of quality growing up around that. And uh, just the idea of, uh, like you said, Mike, you know, you're talking about the spiritual aspect of this, you know, back to our roots, you know, being able to name the animals and uh, groom them, you know, animal husbandry, all that stuff, all the, this goes back to, harkens us back to our, uh, the roots, uh, to our nation, you know, take, takes yeah. you back, you know, that's, that's what the beauty of it. Yeah, it's really, I mean, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to. I certainly don't want to change the subject here, be, but it's sort of like a lot of times, like the rest of the world will like look at look at our country and they'll be like, uh, "I just can't understand, you know, Americans. I can't understand this whole uh, Second Amendment thing and everything else." But really, what what I think separates America from um, a lot of other places is just the fact that um, we do. It's individual responsibility. I mean, I hate to say it, but we're responsible for you for ourselves. The, the sort of the rugged individualism. Um, it, it it entails uh, being able to uh, defend our families, defend ourselves and our families, um, educate ourselves and our family, provide for ourselves and our family, and really, what I I, I really see homesteading uh, very much as a part of the American. Uh, a value, American dream, if you will, what it is to be the American DNA uh, as any other part, freedom of speech, uh, freedom to bear arms. I, I think it's all part and parcel. Uh, what do you think, Jeremy? Uh, I, I totally agree. I mean, you guys have said a few things that have really made me think about a couple of things that I do on my farm. Um, you know, first you said, well, you didn't have a mom and a dad that were into homesteading to teach you animal husbandry and all that. I I didn't either. I'm a city boy from Buffalo, New York, originally. So I am very much a product of the culture that you just described that was out of touch with the heartland, the smaller communities. You know, I was in that culture of, I want it, I go get it right now, and it's processed and wonderful and it's fast. And that's where a lot of people are at right now. They don't really think about what goes into anything. They just want it, they pay for it, they get it. Um... When I started with the chickens, I started with, you know, having to learn a little bit more about natural processes and that sort of thing. And now as I'm really homesteading and 40 acres and I have uh, a 1949 International Harvester Cub and a 1951 International Harvester M tractor, and I have to fix those up. You had talked about guys that you went to school with that did come from farms and how they were good guys to know because they knew how to do a lot of things. Well, that's what homesteading is a great classroom for adults as well as kids because you have to figure it out. You have to learn how to do all these different things. I'm no, I'm a master of nothing, but I know a little bit about a lot just through having to do it. So it's a worthwhile endeavor from the aspect that I am learning more about what goes into living a life of my own making, not being someone who has to fit into the mold of this 
you know, fast food society where I want it, I go get it. I have to work for it and I have to either make it or figure out how to fix it. And I, it's just so much more satisfying. You know, it's a lot more work. It's not easy, but it's fairly simple. And I appreciate that. I also like now living in a smaller community. Uh, you were talking about sort of that spiritual aspect of it and getting back to some of the core uh, values of our country that seem to be getting lost these days. And I agree. But I think that's because a lot of the folks, especially out towards the bigger cities, not that there's anything wrong with that, but they've kind of lost touch with what it's like to live in a small community where everybody knows everybody, everybody depends on everybody to do what they do. And, um, you know, sometimes that can be uh, difficult just because, you know, small town gossip and all that stuff. But in the grand scheme of things, it's a wonderful thing. I, I know my neighbors. I know where my kids are going. I, there's people, there's eyes everywhere. And uh, we care about each other. You know, if someone stopped on the side of the road, someone's going to stop and ask, are you okay? I never saw that happening in LA or in Boston or in New York. So uh, yeah, no, it's, it's a wonderful life. Wouldn't trade it for anything. You know what uh, just occurred to me, this is a, uh... Uh, you know, normally when you say the Great Reset, you think of something. Well, this is like a, the positive Great Reset, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I, I like the idea. That's why I love, I've always loved this idea. And uh, I own a little bit of land, but I, I don't do anything with it because I'm I'm, uh, I'm lazy and retarded. But uh, <laughs> I, I'd like to get to that point. And, I, you know, I just have too many, you know, uh, irons in the fire. But mm -hmm. but just that idea, it's, it actually is a really good reset, you know, what I mean, just to, to, to be back to uh, like, you know, we just had economic sovereignty and just like, you know, we, we it's life, liberty, pursuit of happiness it goes back to the roots of who we are as a people. So, mm -hmm. I, so I look at it's great. I look at Jeremy as um, as a trailblazer. Yeah, because I, I think um, really what 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 you've done, uh, Jeremy, is you've really uh, well, you just got off your butt. And you did what a lot of us you know, are just thinking about. And, but I think there's more and more people that are taking your lead. And are, are you seeing that as well? Like, are, are you, are we just the only people that are, that are reaching out to you and saying, Jeremy, man, we're, we're, you know, how did you get to where you're at now? And, you know, can I do it too? And, you know, and, and, and what nuggets can you throw my way that'll make, you know, maybe make it a little easier on me. I mean, are you, are you seeing this sort of trend as well? I am. And that's, um, Part of the reason I started doing the YouTube thing, uh, I, I also learned a lot from YouTube. That's one of the great technology things that we do have at our disposal nowadays. But I, I started that YouTube channel and it's mostly because people were interested in how to get started, you know, what are some of the simple things that you have to do. And like I said, some of the things I would say are make sure you plan ahead. Make sure you think about what direction you want to take and where that can go based on your community and, and your climate. And also make sure that you're, you upsize whatever you think you're going to need because you're going to need more. Um, a lot of the folks that I've seen on YouTube and, and that I try to encourage on YouTube are out to do things to make sure that their family is taken care of first and that they can be a positive impact on their community. I really like the idea of trying to make it more clear where your food comes from and what the options for your food are. You know, I definitely say support your local farmers as best as you can. It might sometimes cost a little bit more, but trust me, the quality and the product you're getting is far greater than yeah, what there, you're going to get at Walmart. There, there's really no comparison between no. Um, how you're eating and how uh, Paul is eating. I mean, <laughs> to, to pick on Paul here. <laughs> yeah, come on. Bring I it. mean, uh, it's just, there, there's just a huge difference in there. In, in, the, in, like, there yeah, in the quality of the food. Yeah. I mean, you get my eggs and you get the eggs from Walmart and you crack two in the frying pan together. I guarantee in the first two seconds, you're going to notice a huge difference and then just wait till you eat them. You know, um, the other thing I would definitely say is, you know, homesteading is a wonderful life and I encourage anyone who wants to, to get into it and don't be discouraged if 
you think you've got a lot going on. Like you say, you had a lot of irons in the fire. Well, and I'm not, I'm not being in a peeing match with you, but I have a full-time job. I have a part-time job with the fire department. I have another part-time job that I work a couple of days a month. I've got the kids and I've got the farm. <laughs> so, and it can be done. You know, I do get a lot of help from my dad and from the girls. Um, but if you really want to do it, you can definitely do it. <laughs> but yeah, and, and, I, and I think you've brought, you know, to me, it, it is a family affair. Yeah. And, yeah, that's, uh, that's awesome. you know, this really, you know, what I love about it is it's really not, you know, it's not, it's not a bachelor sport. Um, this really is sort of a lifestyle that, um, that fits nicely with the family. So, you know, the other part, the other aspect is you hear, you hear, you know, I mean, you hear families all the time complaining about the fact that, well, we just don't do anything together. You know, I mean, all the kids are on their electronic devices. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm busy with this. They're busy with school. They've got their own, uh, you know, they don't even know what their kids are up to. They don't know what their kids are doing. I mean, uh, the mm-hmm. other the, the other thing about this lifestyle, I think that a lot of people are, are finding appealing is that it just, it's almost like, you know, a return to Walton's Mountain again. I mean, where everybody's sort of involved in the family business. Yep. It, uh, it definitely brings the family together. There's no doubt about that. And it provides a lot of opportunity to really get to know one another and have those daily talks. Um, we eat around the table every evening uh, and then we sit and talk afterwards. I think that's something that we sorely miss in, in our country these days. Um, but it's important that just because you're family doesn't mean you know each other unless you talk to each other. Mm-hmm. And when you're working on the farm and you're standing right there next to each other, there's no better time than to have great discussions about what's going on in each other's lives and making sure you know where everybody's coming from. It's allowed me to have a lot more faith in my children's ability to make decisions uh, because I know what they're thinking and I know kind of where their head is at. And I can see that, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but it's going to sound that way. I can see that my wife and I have done a good job raising our children. They're, They're good kids. I know I don't have to worry if I let them go on a sleepover at a friend's house or something like that, you know? Um, so it's, it's fantastic for the family. Plus, you know, more hands do make less work and it's a great life lesson for everyone involved. So never be discouraged about getting started, but also be smart in how quickly you upscale. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so you guys doing chickens and ducks, that's fantastic. Maybe next year you add turkeys and rabbits, you know, um, that's totally doable. And then as you go along or as, as the listener goes along and they want to upscale from there, you know, just look into maybe adding one thing a year and see how you do. Make sure you do your research beforehand. Don't be like me and go all zoophilic. Oh, I'm accidental I'm, I'm, and random. I'm, I'm doing exactly <laughs> How you're doing it? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just randomly doing it. It can be fun, this. but it's difficult. It, it is, and and I, you know, so I, I got a question for. I'm not sure how much of the the farming gardening aspect you're doing, but um, you know, one of the challenges that um, you know, once you learn how to grow something, okay, mm-hmm. uh, you know, once you once you know how to you know plant a garden, um, the other challenge that we've immediately ran into was uh, uh, food storage and. Uh, mm-hmm you know, preserving the food, preserving what you what you grow uh, so that you can enjoy it all year long. Right. So we're blessed in the house that we bought. It's um, It needs a lot of work. It's an older house, but it's got some great features to it. There's what I call the prepper room, which is downstairs. It's about 15 wide by 20 long, and it's all cement. Um, downstairs it's a constant temperature of about 60 degrees and it's just lined with shelves and my wife knows how to can so we've got storage for the vegetables there we've bought several chest freezers for the meat and yeah we've got enough storage for quite some time uh, probably more than we've used so far and then just trying to make sure that we're always rotating things out. You know, we do sell at our local farmer's market. I hope that it grows a little bit more. And that's why I encourage everyone to support your local farmer. Uh, they're putting a lot of work in and they're turning out a great product that's more healthy for you. So, 
I, I do um, think I, I do uh, think more people um, are uh, going to farmers markets now. I, I certainly have read uh, uh, where they're you know they are doing they're popping up throughout the country. So there, there's obviously an interest on uh, um, you know more or healthier organic food. So well, hopefully you'll your your local farmers market will continue to grow as well. I mean that's yeah I hope so. I think part of it too is you know here in Northeast Wyoming everybody's got a garden and some animals and whatnot, at least everybody who's just right outside of town, town's fairly small. So, you know, there's probably not as many people that are looking to buy stuff from other people because they have it themselves. But um, the folks true. in town, they do show up. And the challenge I think a lot of people have that do live in cities when they go to a farmer's market is they see the prices and they know they can get that same thing for a buck or so cheaper at Walmart. And yeah. then they're wondering, well, why should I pay that here when I can get it cheaper at Walmart? Well, I, I guarantee if you look into it, you're going to see that the quality of what you're getting at the farmer's market is 10 times better than what's at Walmart. So. Right. And if you can, of course, if you care for animals, you're, that's another good reason. This, a lot of people just are, are unaware of, uh, of how food is produced in this country. I think, it would, it would, I think they'd find it shocking if they were actually to find out. And right. what, what else, uh, what other good uh you know, tidbits or something that we have we, that we've missed today that uh, that the audience needs to know. So, you know, I I can't stress enough planning. If you do want to get into homesteading, dip your toes in with some simple things, either growing or uh, you know chickens or rabbits. And if you can do it debt free, I encourage you to do that. Um, other tidbits. So make sure that you do have support. You know, there's going to be times when you're going to want to go for a long weekend on vacation. You want to make sure that someone's around that can look after things while you're gone. And again, don't be afraid of failure. It's, it's a lot of hard work, but it's definitely worth it. Um, and there's always so many resources out there. There's a lot of great books. There's a lot of great YouTube channels where you can learn how to do things or how not to do things. And that's what I say on my channel all the time is you might not want to do it the way I did it, but at least it might give you some insight on how you want to get it done with a few ideas on how to get started. Yeah. It's amazing how much, um, you know, information's out there and really good. I mean, YouTube's just phenomenal. I mean, uh, you can, you can almost get a video on almost anything these days, which is r really helpful. Um, Jeremy, I, 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 uh, I wrote, where are you going from here? I mean, are you just going to continue to grow? Is it, um, is, is, are you pretty much kind of where you're, where you're at or you just, you don't know, or do you have desires to get, get even, uh, you know, a larger operation? What, 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 uh, what, what's the, the plan for your farm? So I think at this point, we've got all the animals that we want, but we are going to grow in number and in infrastructure. So this year I've got plans to put up a high tunnel because our growing season here in Wyoming is pretty short and a high tunnel can almost double that growing season. So what, um, just for our listeners, what's a high tunnel? High tunnel is kind of like a cross between a Quonset hut and a greenhouse. So it's one of those things, a lot of people have seen them. There's sort of a big hoop house with with um, greenhouse um, plastic on the side. Okay. So it holds in the heat and focuses the sun's rays on the plants to allow for growing. And you're growing in the ground, but with that um, plastic covered arch over the whole thing. Um, kind of difficult to describe in words, I guess. I never really thought about that. Yeah, well, no, I think, I think everyone um, has seen these. They're pretty much throughout the country. I mean, it's... Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So greenhouses, generally, you're growing not in the ground, but in pots. And a high tunnel, you're growing in the ground. But same, same concept. You're using that plastic to focus the sun's rays and to hold the heat. And so that, we're going to put one of... And that expands... Oh, I'm sorry, that, 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 I'm just, that, that expands the, the growing season for you, too, right? It does. It almost doubles it because I mean, we still have snow on the ground today. We're about to hit 40 some degrees. Oh. Um, oh. Yeah. So nice. it's not uncommon for us to have snow well into May. <laughs> yeah. 
um, our growing season is pretty short here. So it'll definitely help us out with our growing season. And then I'm also going to, the, the place that we bought here, um, it had a lot of things as far as a barn and some corrals and a loafing shed, which is where the cows and the chickens are. It's kind of a lean-to style uh, barn. So we had those things here, but they're kind of old and not in the greatest of configuration. So this year I'm gonna put up a barn. I'm about halfway through putting up a hay shed to hold our hay, especially over the winter and you know to keep it out of the weather. Um, and I'm going to redo our pig pens. So I have, you know, a lot of infrastructure things, some more fencing to do. So there is some growth that's going to happen, but it's mostly going to be building uh, different things and increasing the number of animals within the species that we already have. Yeah, there's so much, uh, so much interesting. One of the interesting things I just thought of is. Uh, you, you have to be in tune with the weather. I mean, uh, you know, when, when you're, uh, you're taking on this, uh, this, this lifestyle change, you, you can't just be, you know, live in uh, the burbs and, uh, you know, go about your merry way. Oh, it's raining. Then, you know, it's snowing, it's raining, whatever. I mean, you have to, you have to plan your life out. That's why I, I really like uh, about this is, uh, you have to look at the weather and you have to look at, uh, you know, for caring for your animals and agriculture, something I know nothing about. But uh, okay. you're you're in tune with uh, the Na- weather, you nature. Tune, yeah, nature, all that in tune stuff. With nature. Yeah, I mean oh, it's. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, the other thing you said, I, I got a lot out of, is uh, you know you're you're not afraid to uh, explore, you know, just kind of trying new things out, and some things will take in different. Uh, I would imagine. In different terrain types so like you know here on the east coast i'm sure we could use different uh you know types of animals would be a little bit better suited and then mm-hmm. some of the ones out there where you're at in wyoming is probably not as well suited i mean so it's a little bit of uh, trial and error uh, involved and then just learning and rolling up your sleeves and just kind of seeing you know yeah i mean i just i'm just going to share just a little lesson learned you know from you know the novice that I am, okay. But uh, you were talking about the tr- the gateway drug to uh, homesteading, right? Or the mm-hmm. gateway drug to farming. Yeah. So you know when I started out with my chickens, for instance, I, I got a chicken coop. Okay, I just figured, well, I'm getting. You know, I'm I remember buying, that. I'm buying chickens. Yeah. I need a, I need a chicken <laughs> coop, right? Like Mike's got chickens. Um, yeah. but listen, in the it. So what I've learned since then is that that's not really the way to go. Was a permanent. Uh, chicken coop sort of structure and what I've um, uh, progressed to is a very lightweight frame uh, that has chicken wire has a cover over the top so you know they're they're not getting rained on or anything like that Uh, Mm -hmm. we do have hawks um, and they have no problem coming down and grabbing your chicken Uh, so you know the the the, the very lightweight frame is is uh, is fenced in it's a you know there's chicken wire but I have that whole apparatus on uh, skids and I'm able just to slide that thing around on fresh grass every day. Yeah. You call and, that a chicken tractor. Yes. And yeah. I didn't start out doing that cause I didn't know anything about that. And that's just something like, you know, again, trial and error, seeing what other people are doing. Um, so, I didn't, I didn't even think about, I didn't even think about, you know, things like, you know, chicken manure, being you know good for the garden and good yeah. for the grass and all that stuff, but Some of the best. But so uh, just I need a clue there. So you're 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 maneuvering maneuvering this thing around because of manure. I uh, well and to, no uh, because they and they give them some fresh grass. Got it. I mean they're absolutely excited when I slide that small little pin onto some fresh grass. <laughs> the small they, they love it. Yeah. And uh, and I noticed a difference in the health of my chickens as soon as I took them out of the permanent structure and started moving them around the lawn. <laughs> You know, even my wife is, you know, even my wife came out and says, man, the chickens look so much healthier. Mm, and of course yeah. they do. Yeah, I love the, uh, now just to get um, uh, scriptural for a second, biblical, you know, the uh, the creation mandate, if you will. Uh, that's from Genesis uh, chapter 1, verses 28. Let them have, let us make man in our image and uh, give them a dominion, you know, over the animals, over the earth and mm-hmm. 
And, uh, and so the idea of that is you're, you're really returning to the first job uh, of yep. that man was created to do. Man was put in a garden to live there. That's the beauty of that. And then, uh, you know, name the animals, tend the animals, care for them, eat them. That's- you know, yeah, and make sure and you're eat the tasty for animals. Right. Yeah, all that stuff, and so that you're having dominion, and uh, that is refreshing instead of just being, you know, in a, uh, a consumer. Yeah, consumer, uh, and then you you get your meat that's uh, pumped full of all of this nonsense, and then it's shrinking your balls, you yep. know, <laughs> and then all this stuff. <laughs> you're like, wow, I feel like uh, you like my grandma here, and uh, you know. Because you got no more testosterone, and uh, yeah, and then of course not only that, but the, just what are they putting in the food? You know, because uh, just a, a slight tangent, we found literally this was years ago, but we found a uh, back when we used to go to uh, McDonald's a lot. Uh, anyway, we had some. Uh, yeah, not picking on Ronald here. Yeah, but, not picking on Ronald, but we had like a cheeseburger or whatever, and it had fl- slid under one of the uh, back seats, and that burger was still good to go. And it, <laughs> it was probably like four or five years old. I'm like, now that ain't right. That nope. bun was that bun was good to go. I mean, you could have slapped that sucker in the microwave and good, and you you got and a sold it. meal and sold yeah. it. <laughs> sold it. I mean, so that that's not good. So whatever huh. that is in that, you got to be thinking, wow, what are they doing? Yeah, we about? have no clue what's in our food. No, nah, man. And to back uh, up for a second, I mean, that's, I, I agree with everything you just said, but there's another aspect to that. So when you talk about that spiritual aspect and what we were originally tended to do, I got to tell you, I feel like I have a, a life well lived every day. And if I continue to do this, I know it's a very fulfilling life for me. I can tell you that my worst day on the farm is still better than someone's best day binging Netflix. Oh yeah. Mm. You know what I mean? I I could, I could work my butt off on the farm all day and lose an animal. And I would still be more satisfied than having sat in a recliner and binge the latest episode of whatever is on streaming TV. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I yeah. can't say enough for how fulfilling of a life it is, despite the fact that there's there's ups and downs, but at least I know I'm an active participant. So, so Jeremy, I you know before we um, you know we're kind of running up against the wall here, but before we before we let you go, and we really do appreciate you coming on. Um, how do people find you? How do people find your channels and find out what you're doing and what you got going on? Sure. I'd love to have uh, your listeners come check us out at the Rustic Hills Homestead on YouTube. Uh, that's just the Rustic Hills Homestead. And if you're interested in any of the products from the farm, it's zoophologfarm.com. There's a link on the community page on the YouTube channel. So if you can't spell zoopholic, that's okay. You can find us right through the YouTube channel. Um, and we would love to uh, try and show you what we're doing on the Rustic Hills Homestead. Awesome. Uh, Jeremy, thanks for, for coming on the podcast. I, for one, am uh, a little bit smarter. And uh, that's saying a lot because I know nothing about agriculture. Can't even say it. Uh, but uh, homesteading is something I know absolutely nothing about. And uh, I am motivated now to kind of look into this. So I got, appreciate that. Yeah, you got yeah. that land sitting out there just calling your name. You planted a seed, my friend. Appreciate you. Feel free to reach out with any questions. I'd be happy to answer what, what I've gotten to up till now. Awesome. Thank you, sir. You bet. You guys have a great day. you enjoyed today's episode of the Pinelander Podcast. If you enjoy our unique content, please consider supporting our sponsors. Soft News, providing special operations news from around the world. It's where Paul and I go to keep abreast of what's going on within the soft community. Check them out at soft.news. Blacksmith Publishing, been serving the warrior class since 2013. They have great titles written for warriors, by warriors. If you're looking for excellent reference material or just want to unwind with a great novel, be sure to check out the bookstore located at blacksmithpublishing.com. And if you're looking for some cool Pinelander apparel, head on over to the General Store located at pinelandergeneralstore.com. That's all one word, pinelandergeneralstore.com. Have a great selection of shirts, hats, jackets, Sweaters, stickers, patches, artwork, and a whole lot more. 
check out the store at pinelandergeneralstore.com. If you're interested in helping develop our country's next generation of warriors, uh, please consider donating to the American Agogi Project. The mission of the project is to foster an environment producing able-bodied citizen warrior men of fine character. And we'll be officially launching the project in 2023 in celebration of uh, Blacksmith Publishing's 10th anniversary. Until our next meeting, stay mentally and tactically smart, physically and spiritually strong, and socially astute. To each other, we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. May God continue to bless Pineland.